Hey, it's John and welcome to the interview. Today I'm joined by Wes Schaefer, who is the sales whisperer, a pig-headed entrepreneur who rehabilitates salespeople and trains their managers. He's a reassuringly expensive copywriter, sought after speaker, and marketing automation aficionado. He's the author of 2.5 books, got one unfinished yet, I guess, on sales. Not unfinished, in, in progress. <laughs> in sales, marketing, and entrepreneurship. He's the host of the Sales Podcast and the, the CRM Sushi Podcast. That sounds yummy. And has helped 5,400 of the world's top speakers, authors, coaches, and sales professionals achieve nearly miraculous growth by mastering his proven process he is the sales whisperer. He's going to chat a little bit about his sales journey, his entrepreneurial journey, how he keeps himself rocking and rolling and in top shape and what he's up to in the future. So Wes, let's do it, man. How you doing? Hey, go back and read that again. That sounded really good. Yeah, man. Well, we'll rewind it for everybody. <laughs> yeah, you just like hearing people talk about you. Huh? <laughs> hey, that's enough about you. Let's talk about me. All yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell the readers or the listeners rather, uh, what, uh, what's your background? Let's, let's get a Reader's Digest version of, of your, your background just so they can cozy up to you a little bit. Any, any of Fletch fans? Man, I, I, I was a sheep herder, right? Yeah? No. Yeah, you know, everybody's young now, man. I'm the old guy. Nobody knows the old references. Um, I was a meteorologist in the Air Force. So if I could get into sales and entrepreneurship, so can you. <laughs> there the stars is aligned. Well, there you go. So... Yeah, after five years on active duty, 1997, I got out, I had a wife, we had a baby, we had another one on the way, uh, and I jumped into full-time commission sales. I wanted to be paid according to my production, not based on my time and grade or tenure, right? And sales was the way to, to maximize that and to maximize earnings. I think only like heart surgeons uh, make more money than salespeople. And so anybody can get into sales with any background, any degree or no degree, uh, if they apply themselves and, you know, become a student of human nature, uh, if you seek to serve, if you understand your role is just to solve problems, then the sky's the limit. Absolutely. Yeah. So you just were kind of like me when wanted to do your own thing and didn't want a ceiling over your head, right? You just wanted to be exactly. able to climb and get as good as you could get and, and go after it and make a good living for your family and yep. the whole, a whole nine yards. Right. Absolutely. So have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur then or like before that you were in the military though, right? So were you kind of like always the kids selling eggs door to door or like setting up a lemonade stand or was that, did that come later? Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't that over the top. I mean, a friend of mine in high school, he was, he was a DJ, right? He was DJing all of our dances, all the other high school dances. I mean, he was a true entrepreneur uh, from day one. I, you know, I did well, like in selling candy bars, you know, for the school fundraiser. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't anything crazy. Uh, I did start looking into things like network marketing and stuff when I was still in the Air Force. So I started to get the itch, like how else, how can I create multiple streams of income? You know, things like that. And, um, you know, I just jumped into, into sales, just, I was a little bit naive, um, thinking, thinking the corporate world would be so much better than the military, and really it wasn't. Uh, in many ways, it was worse. Um, much less camaraderie, right? Much less, really, honor. Hmm. Uh, it's cutthroat, you know? It's a lot of uh, looking out for yourself, unfortunately. Um, and so, the whole entrepreneurial thing really started after almost a decade of, 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 of turmoil, you know, working in the high tech industry. Uh, I, I jumped into, I was recruited over to a tech firm in June of 2000, right? The market had topped. We just didn't know it yet. Yeah. Uh, so after all types of ups and downs, I was like, man, if things are going to be this crazy as an employee, I might as well just go be crazy on my own. Yeah. You weren't in one of those dog food startups or whatever that were in somebody's garage at 2001, were you? No, it wasn't that bad. I mean, they were real companies with real okay. revenue, but it was technology. And, yeah. you know, that first job, my claim to fame was I was the last one hired, the youngest, the least experienced, and I was the last one let go. Right. So, that, so um, 
So that was enough turmoil. You said I can I can go cause this much turmoil on my own. Oh my god! I can't remember which one of my guests said it, but I thought it was a good phrase. It's like if you could if you can make somebody if you're good at making someone else money, you can go out and figure it out for yourself, right? So yeah, there you go, yeah. right? And it, obviously, it's a little bit different. You've got to have yeah. the the temperament, you know. But um, there's no there's no guarantee in corporate America. But you know, on the flip side, I mean, I mean, I made great money, right? I was. I was making 180 grand uh, at one point in the tech industry in sales. And, you know, that's good money. Yep. Um, and if I was patient, you know, if I was a little more uh, politically correct, right? I mean, 10 years later, 13 years later, I'd be running some division. I'd be some VP of sales, probably making three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, stock options, healthcare, you know. So, there's benefits to it. You know, I, the thing that rubs me wrong is seeing all these entrepreneurs just badmouth corporate America, right? Mm. Like basically it's like, it's my way or no way. If you're not an entrepreneur, you're right. just a wimp. You know, it's right, like, right. you know what, dude? I mean, one of my best friends and really a mentor, we've worked at a couple of companies together. He stayed in corporate America his whole career. And that guy's making bank. He's the number one salesman at a, like a fortune 50 company. His checks are fat, um, I would not say that he's a wimp for no. staying in corporate America, right? So, you know, take these lessons and, and grow where you're planted, you know. Yeah. And, to each his own, right? I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, I, yeah, I, I get annoyed with that too. Like they need to kind of do away with this whole entrepreneur at all costs thing. It's kind of like a, a club or something, a cult almost that people kind of treat it like. And oh, like, yeah. Whatever, dude. Like, you know, that's great. You know, and you decided to do that. I decided to do that. I think the biggest thing we were chasing was the F word, right? Freedom. Yeah. And you know, that's the, that's the, the bonus of, of what we're doing here. So yeah. cool. So yeah. Tell me about the sales whisperer then. So you, you were in corporate America, you were in high tech, you're making a nice living. And so what you just said one day I'm done and, and I'm going to start my own thing. And you know, the, the tech industry was turning upside down at that time. And is that what happened or how did you get into starting the, your sales journey on your yeah, own. Yeah, it wasn't that stark. I mean, I just, I went through a couple of different startups. I was, I was at one um, for almost three years and got let go. We were struggling also, but I was also, I mean, just bashing heads with my VP. Um, I was living out in California. I'd moved with that company. My wife's from out here. Um, but I had taken a, a 12 week teleclass in early 06. And, you know, at that point I'd been out nine years, I'd made a hundred thousand dollars at least every year in sales as an employee. And, uh, but I wanted to get better. I knew, I knew I was working too hard. I knew, uh, I could, I could streamline. Uh, and I signed up this 12 week course. It was 600 bucks. You know, you got a PDF, uh, no video, no, no social media, no private Facebook group to ask questions 24 seven and have people from around the world help you, you know, the drop of a hat. And that course changed my life. Mm. Taught me how to have a process, how to be much more uh, scientific, you know, with my sales approach. Sales is very technical, very predictable. You know, elaborate on that a little bit. Like, what did you learn that was so life changing? I mean, that just how to keep metrics or how to put. Yeah, well, in? Matt, yeah, you know the old adage. You know, whatever you measure can be improved, right? If you can measure it, you can improve it. Mm -hmm. um, but also, just having a process and sticking with it, having an agenda uh, for every appointment, uh, not winging it. Okay, but understanding as well. You know, people. You look at like a magician or, or a band, right? Back in like, I think it was 2014, I saw the band Chicago, right? They've been around for, they started writing, releasing songs in the, in the late 60s before I was born, mm -hmm. right? Some of, their, some of their original members are in their 70s, right? They're older than my dad. <laughs> and um, I met uh, the lead singer at the time, Jason Sheff. He had replaced uh, Peter Cetera back in the 80s. And I met him at an Infusionsoft conference, actually. And he bought my Infusionsoft book and had me sign it, right? And I was like, dude, you should sign my Infusionsoft book, yeah. you know? Uh, but he was a cool guy. And he's like, hey, when we come to town, we'll give you tickets. And sure enough, they came to town. And sure enough, he gave me backstage passes. And 
and it was cool, right? But I'd never seen them perform. And they sounded just like their album. Wow. Totally, right? So these guys had been playing those songs for 50 years. They could phone it in, right? But they didn't. Mm. They put their heart into it and because they knew that there were people like me who for the first time ever were hearing them, even though they've played that song probably a hundred thousand times. So as a salesperson, do you get bored with this process? If you do, then you're in trouble because everybody follows a process. If you don't have an exact process, then it's just, Oh, Hey John, how are you? Right. John says, I'm doing well. Oh, Good. <laughs> How's the weather out there? Yeah, exactly. Huh? Hey, I'm just uh, calling to follow up. I'm just right. calling to see, did, did you get my email? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I just haven't had a time, chance to look at it, Wes. But hey, thanks for calling. You know, when I get around to it, I, I'll get back in touch with you if there's any interest. And you're done. Right. Because you were winging it. Because right. you didn't feel like, people say, if I follow a script, then I can't really be myself. Right. I just, I, I'm just, I, I'm in the, in the moment kind of person. I'm, I'm a people person, you know, and, and I take what they give me and you know, like, no dude. Right. Yeah. It's about being intentional about having a consistent process. Right. Yeah. You're the, you, you got that dialed in. So, all right. So let's go back to your journey then. Uh, so you started the sales whisperer and you've, you've now taken this to, you've been doing this now for a while, but what, at least 10 years with under that brand, right? The sales whisperer. 13. Yeah. 13. And uh, you've worked with, you know, over 5,000 people now. So, it's, you know, you accomplished quite a bit with that. Um, tell me some of the biggest lessons you learned growing that brand. Anything you, you would pass along to somebody who wants to do that uh, type of thing? Any lessons learned in the trenches? Well, you know, when you begin, um, make sure you've got reserves. Right. And even on my own podcast, talking to over 400 people, it's like most of them prepared. <clears throat> they didn't just jump out. Right. Built up some savings, had a little bit of a plan. Okay. Because um, when you just jump, it can be rough. I had laid the foundation. I ended up working with that sales trainer and became a licensee of his. Um, and I, I was going to resign from my company probably in the next three to six months. You know, I wanted to build a little more, but when they let me go, you know, I was like, well, I guess this is it, yep. you know, and jumped into it. So, uh, but prepare, right? If you, if you think you're just going to jump out and, and again, wing it, just good old blood, sweat and tears. I mean, you might make it, uh, you might have a heck of a time. Yeah, we always hear the story of the guy with five, 200 bucks in his account, but you, know, you don't hear the other stories where, uh, you know, 100 of those other people in that situation failed and had to go back to work. So, Yeah, they call it survivor bias, right? Just like in, in the yeah. stock market. Right. You know, the average company grows, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, those that made it. Right, exactly. How many didn't? Right. You know, and, and again, the, you know, the exception is not the rule. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Same thing. My first job, I was a stockbroker, and you know, and the old adage was, people overestimated what they could achieve in a year, but underestimated what they could achieve in five. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to like double their money this year. You know, like, dude, you're not going to double your money this year. You can double your money in five with some good investments. Right. You know, not in one. Uh, so you got to have you know more realistic expectations. Um, it's going to be harder than you think. Um, you know, you got to choose who to lose. Um, you know, and people, they better learn sales. You know, I, I've got a program, you know, I say to make any sale, you have to make every sale. Mm. And people are like, are you saying every, you, everybody you speak to, you, you close them and you make the sale? I'm like, no. But every time I did make a sale, I made every sale. Meaning... My ad looked right. My landing page was consistent. My headlines, the color, the font colors, the, the video or not having the video, the email header, the email delivery, the timing of it. Did I send a text message? What, what was my phone message like? 
How did we do a demo? How did we negotiate? What did the proposal look like? Every one of those steps is a sale. And mm -hmm. every one of those steps, the prospect could have said no. They could have said, they could have ignored my ad. They could have clicked on that ad, gone landing page, and not opted in. They could have opted in and not opened the email. They could have opened the email, not clicked on the ad or the link to schedule a time to talk. They could have scheduled a time to talk and skipped out on that meeting. Mm -hmm. They could have shown up to the meeting and not answered my questions, been very withdrawn, closed in right? Not allowing me to dig in and find a way that I can help them. Okay. They could have said no to my pricing. They could have made the first payment and not made any more. They could have filed a charge back. Okay. So to make any sale, you got to make every sale. But yep. most people, they just wing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, good luck with that. Let me know how that works out. Right. Having a consistent process, there's all these dropout points right. along the journey, you know, and just because you got a customer doesn't mean they're always going to be a customer, right? Or a client. So you know, they're going to be a happy customer, yeah, right? You need right. to think, you need to think about the fifth sale to that person. Most prospect, most salespeople, they're just running, gone, make the sale and they're off and running. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the biggest mistakes they make for sure. All right. Well, let's segue into your day. Like let's, let's talk about, you know, you're, you're a busy guy. You've done a lot of good things with your brands and your sales and all that kind of stuff. Let's just, let's just dig into your day a little bit. What's, what's your day tend, what does your day tend to look like? Well, yeah, I work from home. <clears throat> I try not to travel. And um, so I end up not traveling much. It's pretty nice. Um, I wake up early, usually about five o'clock. Um, I immediately make coffee. Um, and then I do some reading. I do some writing um, for a while. I mean, a couple of hours, you know. Uh, depending on projects, whatever we're supporting with clients, you know, I, sometimes I'll go, you know, a day or two and not check email, which is nice. But then if, if things are popping, you know, after I do some reading and writing, I will go ahead and check email. Um, cause I just want to make sure there's no fires to put out. I've got an overseas staff, so they're working at night, you know, when, uh, I'm sleeping. So, I'll check Upwork, I'll check the, um, um, our project management portal, see if there's any questions, anything, because they, because I wake up early, they're kind of ending their day. So that way, if, if there is something, we can kind of tweak it before they're done and before my day starts. Uh, but, you know, in my calendar, you know, again, going back to investing days, you know, the old adage was pay yourself first. Mm-hmm. You know, people, they're in debt, so they just, all the money goes towards all their debt payments, and, and I understand, uh, but man, you need to have that rainy day fund, okay? Because if you just, if you're running around constantly trying to serve everybody else, you know, the old adage, you know, should we, uh, should we encounter an unexpected uh, loss of cabin pressure for oxygen mask will descend from the panel above you, you know? If you're traveling with someone else, Put yours on first. Mm -hmm. It's not selfish. Okay? You got to be alive to help your children, your spouse, your elderly parents. So pay yourself first. That's why I read and I write first. I get it out of the way. I pay myself first. But also on my calendar are, is my schedule. And, and, and it starts with my personal schedule. Okay? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at noon, I do jujitsu. Okay. And it's, it's a 90 minute class, but I got to get there early. I got to come back and shower and eat. It's two, two and a half hours out of the middle of my day. Mm -hmm. That's blocked out. So if you, you get a link from me to my calendar, that's not an option. And Thursday we train at night. So I schedule in my personal time first. Mondays, I do my own podcast. People are like, can we have a meeting Monday? No, you cannot. Right? I'm paying myself first. So literally, first thing in the morning and first day of the week, I'm paying myself first. Fridays, I have blocked out totally as well, personal development. But sometimes, if it's an emergency, right? I, I have an opening on a Monday. I have an opening on a Friday. Something's going on. Tomorrow, I've got a call at 8 a.m. with a big client. You know, it's a big team meeting. It's not a regular thing. So I made time for it, mm -hmm. right? But it's, that's the exception, not the rule. So I pay myself first, right? 
And then I, I set my own, my own calendar. Like I don't want to be taking meeting, even though I'm up at five, I don't want to be talking to people at seven 30, my time. I don't want to. So now when someone needs it again, I've got another good client. He's on the East coast. He's in Florida. He's doing a big launch right now. He just, uh, we're rolling out a new integration for him. And he was like, you know, when are you available? He's not pushing. He's not demanding. And I'm like, dude, I, I can talk at seven. That's fine. Let's do it. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's the first time stress testing the system in an actual live production environment. So I make myself available, mm -hmm. you know. So this week's been hectic. Next week it'll die down. Two weeks from now, probably won't hear from the guy. Right. You know, in a good way. He's happy, but I got a retainer and, and things roll. So, you know, pay yourself first. Right. So you manage your calendar by plugging in your personal self first. You're sharpening the saw, your yep. physical, mental stuff to keep you the asset because you're the asset in this case sharp. Yeah. For all your meetings. I can't tell you how many times like I get an email. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. Please let me know when you're, when you're up and uh, give me a call. And then you go, you know, three hours go by and you get back, you get online. Oh, never mind. We, we, we figured it out. <laughs> like, yeah. Nice. People get, people panic about things. Yeah. yeah. Fires, putting out fires. Uh, so what are you reading right now, Wes? What do you like to read? Oh man. What do you I don't, got? Know if I, I don't know if I should share this one. It's not, is it appropriate or what? So we have to get, get the blur out in the, in the video here. <clears throat> it's totally appropriate. All right. But some things, you know, I, you know, do you really love, do you really love your guest? Do I really love them? I guess it depends. It's kind of or, some, or, or your, your, your listener, your subscribers. <laughs> well, I have to say yes. Oh, interesting. So see right there <laughs> being in sales. Listen to not only what is said, but how it is said. There you go. Very, very telling right there. <laughs> so I had this guy on my podcast uh, years ago, and I was fortunate enough to meet him in London when I was out there last November. Uh, but his name is Ian Rowland. Mm -hmm. And this book is The Full Facts. What is it? Full Facts book on cold reading. So like card counting? No. Cold reading. <clears throat> So those are tarot cards. Oh, I thought they were like a poker book or something. I was like, no. Oh. So this guy, he, he's a great author, sales trainer, actually, and, and consultant. He's like, look, I'm not a psychic. I don't believe in psychics. I don't believe in any of this stuff. He's like, are there real psychics? I'm like, maybe. But I can tell you it ain't me. Like, mm -hmm. But I can tell you I made a good living telling people their futures. And I made all this stuff up. Hmm. It's crazy. Okay. And because what he talks about is basically how to soften people up uh, and how to win them over to you, but also how not to be played. Hmm. Okay. Because there's the old adage in poker, right? Is uh, if you don't know who the chump is at the table, it's you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because people are always like, Oh, I'm in HR. I, I'm in engineering and operations. I'm not in sales. The hell you aren't. Okay. When I was selling technology, I would look for the engineers and just chat them up. Mm -hmm. Look for the receptionist, pay them a compliment. You know, it's funny. Like I do a lot of these things. Now this guy is a professional. He's got, he's got a hundred things memorized, right? I I'd, I'd do two or three just out of, just natural people skills, but it's paying people a compliment, a sincere compliment, and then listening. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a funny, funny meme where people talk about it, uh, like women say, Oh, I love your jumper. And how do they reply? It's got pockets, right? So the <laughs> girl, like, and it's so funny. Like, if you think about it, like, yeah, or, oh, you know, you'll hear women, Oh my gosh, I love your purse. Oh, this old thing. I just, there was a sale. I like to tell the whole story, mm -hmm. right? Cause just giving them one little compliment. That's how people are, you know? So is that manipulative? No, not at all. I mean, people pay them a compliment. Life is hard, right? People are going through struggles. Uh, but can you use that to your advantage? Absolutely. Can you keep the conversation going? 
because the more they talk, the more info you're going to pick up. And then you can use that later on to make the sale. All right. So you're reading a book on that. Anything else you got going on that you can think of off the top of your head that you enjoy reading? Um, man, I read, dude, my library is huge and that whole wall spills over and it <laughs> spills into the garage. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've read, golly, Atlas Shrugged, you know, Ayn Rand. I've been reading George Orwell. I'm reading. It's a variety of books then, not just sales. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, not just sales, but I mean, things on like on the mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, I read comic books or not comic books, joke books. Mm -hmm. Um, I am studying some on, on cartoons and comics. Um, I'm working on a diary of a wimpy salesman. Uh, and that's all illustrated. So, um, yeah, all kind of things. I have to put you in my in touch with my friend, Stu Heineck. He's a wall street journal, uh, cartoonist and, and marketer. He's, uh, oh yeah. He does he his, take um, on projects? He, he does, um, cartoon campaigns for what he calls contact marketing. So they're basically to get people's attention and stuff. Um, he used to use them in direct mail a lot and had really high response rates, but, uh, oh, yeah. Now he sends these like large cartoon boards to prospects or like a dream 100 list kind of thing, you know? Oh, and what's his name? It's pretty good. Um, Stu? pretty good response rate. Stu Heineck. Yep. Just had a book launch on how to get a, how to get the meeting. Really cartoon interesting. Book. link. All right. I'll look yeah, at I, I can inter intro you or whatever after the interview sure. if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant guy. But anyway, um, very cool. Hey, enough about him. Back to me. Back to Back me. Back to me now. Let's keep, let's eyes, keep focused. Eyes right here. here. Eyes on me. Let's keep focused. So, um, very cool. Um, so, yeah, get towards the end of the interview here. I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, from just personally, like your, 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 if you'll share your business model, like kind of how you structure things. Uh, like you do mostly coaching, uh, you know, courses, challenges, the whole nine yards, done for you stuff. What, what is it? What, is, what, are you, what are you working on over there? I can say fortunately and unfortunately all of the above. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fortunate because it has brought a uh, breadth of uh, income streams. Uh, I say unfortunately because I'm realizing it is time to kind of narrow the focus. Uh, so I, earlier this year, you know, I, I cut a couple of programs of group programs, put them all into one. Um, I am, bringing on a technical partner to take on more of the, um, the done for you stuff. Uh, cause I haven't done them right. I would sell them and I got a team. Uh, but it w I was still kind of overseeing it and assigning it. Um, and so he's going to take over all of that. Um, then I'm going to get much more strategic on keynote speaking, uh, which I want to do more of. I'm willing to travel a little more now, um, but, uh, still not a lot, but that's a great way to get the word out, uh, a great form of marketing. Uh, and I like doing it. So, um, so we're going to be tightening things up here in the next year. The streamlining things a little bit more, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Um, yeah. So as we wrap this up, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, what's the type of impact you'd like to make in the second half of your life here? Like what, what kind of impact do you want to leave? before you leave this earth, what kind of like legacy impact do you want to make? Um, you know, two and a half years ago, I started writing uh, from today's reading from today's reading.com. And I do a daily um, blurb on uh, Bible reading Bible verse. Uh, and I started writing that two and a half years ago. And I saw this guy that's kind of a fallen away dude, you know, rough, tough, look at me with my beard and tattoos and, American flag and waving my guns and I'm just this really tough guy. And some people need that, I guess. Um, but I wanted to at least give people an alternative, right? An option, uh, that that's one way to grow and live. You know, I think there's another way to grow and live. I mean, you can be in business, you can do good things, you can make a lot of money, uh, mm -hmm. and still be centered and grounded, uh, faith based and, you know, leave your mark on the world uh, in that regard versus a scorched earth 
you know, look at, look at all the bodies I piled up. Right. So that's my goal, giving people, um, uh, and an alternative path, uh, to sales and, uh, soul success. <laughs> there you go. All right, Wes. Well, as we wrap this up, let, let's let everybody know where they can find out more about you. We'll of course have those links below this video on the show notes page, but if someone is inspired by your in- incredible story here, where could they reach out? Yeah, the, the simplest is just go to the saleswhisper.com. Um, there's a little chat window there that can help you navigate what you're looking for. There's also a few um, CTAs right there on the homepage for different reports, the CRM quiz, the seven daily sins of selling. I mean, all types of things that I'm creating. So, you know, but start there. Mm-hmm. And uh, my phone number is there. My, uh, and that's my number. Uh, my social media accounts are all there. Uh, and I don't, nobody, I don't third party that. So if you get a response, it's from me. So don't be a stranger. All right. Sounds good. Well, appreciate your time today and hope everybody enjoyed this discussion with Wes Schaefer, the sales whisperer. Go ahead and check out the sales to get a hold of Wes. I hope you all enjoyed this discussion and we'll see you on the next one.